Good afternoon, everybody. Let me begin with some comments on the theme of towards a green energy transition. Because it's nearly 30 years that have passed since the Brundtland Report and the Rio Earth Summit. And in 2013, the World Economic Forum's 2013 report, uh, Energy Transitions, Past and Future, pointed out that the transition is not a, an abrupt change from one reality to another, but rather a shift that unfolds generationally over a considerable time. Yet, as we consider the desirability and feasibility of shifting to a green energy transition, I believe we're bound to agree with the recent IRENA report on the global renewable outlook that there has been a widening gap between rhetoric and action. And we'll be looking forward to hearing from Ricardo Guarini from Irena, our first speaker on this and other related issues. The highest figure that most of us can find show renewable forms of energy, excluding traditional biomass, as providing only 12% of world primary energy consumption and 26% of world electricity generation. These figures include hydropower, which still contributes to a higher percentage of primary energy consumption than so-called new renewables. But it's not only current, but past rhetoric, which is worthy of closer consideration. For much of the past 30 years, the UK's wind energy industry would claim it would not support developments which failed to reach an annualised capacity factor of 30%. How come, therefore, that currently 70% of onshore UK wind energy developments with installed capacities over 500 kilowatts are achieving capacity figures below 30%, and indeed 15% of them below 20%. Yes, capacity factors are creeping up, although they have a worrying habit of commencing early declines, and offshore these capacity factors are mostly significantly higher, over 50% currently at one location off Scotland, and four off Germany's shores. But we should be wary about claims that they will or can reach 58% onshore and 60% offshore, when according to Betz's coefficient, which has stood the test of time for over a century, the theoretical limit is 59.3%. Then there's all the publicity surrounding solar PV, especially ground-based PV. Here, the capacity figures range in the UK from 9% to 12%. There are four schemes achieving 13%, but two of them are on the roofs of farm buildings. In Germany, solar PV factors achieved are also in the 9 to 13% range. But once north of Bavaria, declines from the high end set in quite markedly. A not dissimilar story emerges from Germany's onshore wind energy, although from north to south, as capacity factors achieve decline as one moves further from the Baltic Sea coast. So, Ulrich Lomans will be no doubt providing us with further insights into this aspect of efforts to achieve a green transition and some of the obstacles that lie in the way. But levels of solar insulation vary, as do mean wind speeds and Marina Economoidu will no doubt be able to give us a more optimistic view from the vantage point of the Mediterranean Basin and other middle latitudes. The supply of solar panels and their filing prices, however, over the past decade, owe a great deal to Chinese exports, something George Nemet seems to have overlooked in his recent book on solar energy, as does the supply of onshore wind turbines. Uh, West Vestas and Siemens appear to be holding their own offshore. Well, our speakers may have something to say about China and Belt and Road and even COVID-19. They may even point out that the major industrialization to industrial nations of the world, of, of the West and Japan and Australia in particular, have been able to duck carbon emissions by gaining benefits from their being generated elsewhere. Finally, but no less important for that, Melidreus will, I trust, remind us of how dependent so many economies and households are upon natural gas 
when the wind isn't blowing enough and the sun isn't bright enough. So let us start with Ricardo. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Jefferson. And thank you all. It's a pleasure on behalf of Irena to be here uh, to present our, our views on the energy transition. And so let me uh, start with a brief explanation. So the International Renewable Energy Agency is, is a global institution. As you can see, we have uh, 160 plus member countries. Um, as a context of our conversation today, I would like to start uh, saying that indeed uh, pre-COVID-19, so a couple of years ago, what we, we, we saw was the graph that you see in the middle of the screen, that's the renewable energy increasing uh, quite significantly as well. That could be explained by the first graph on the top, that it's the decrease on cost from the last decade. So this is a, quite a transformation that we see. As well, in our future perspectives, we understand that these trends are ongoing, so they will keep that, as you can see in the graph below. So basically, the COVID has brought uh, interesting um, changes in, the, in the, the whole behavior as well industry of course there is a, an important impact in all the markets and the economies but basically we also see a raising sustainability awareness on the on the agenda so having said that i would like to uh, present uh, one of our studies that's exactly uh, related to this global renewable outlook so the transition discussions inside the irena so please uh, this is the first uh, important um, idea that I would like to share with you. First, we will concentrate the presentation in what we call the transforming energy scenario, so TESS. This scenario is uh, the transition towards well below two degrees. We also have some ideas on this deeper decarbonization perspective. I may bring some insights, but basically we'll discuss the well below two degrees related scenario. First, the energy transition Indeed, it's not just about emission reduction. So when we look at the landscape, there are other goals, other objectives on the agenda. So as you can see here, uh, and now it's very important due to this COVID situation, the job creation related or air quality aspects, but overall is a mix of goals and each region or country has its own priorities. I must say also that energy security uh, as, as always, is very much in the agenda. Well, in terms of this normative scenario, the transforming energy, so as you can see, the historical uh, progress in terms of renewable energy uh, share in total final energy consumption has grown uh, a bit to around 10%. There is a perspective from current policies that that could reach 25% by 2050, Indeed, what we would like to see is uh, a further increase to up 66% by 2050. So this is the level of effort that we need in terms of renewable energy share increase. Of course, it's important uh, together with energy efficiency to deliver the emission reduction and the transformation that we are talking about. So both together, renewable energy and energy efficiency will bring the mitigation down. How, so as you can see here, end use sectors, they have a very important role to play. We need to increase the renewable energy penetration, not just in the power sector, but also in the renewable, in, in each one of all the end use sectors. As you can see here, uh, transport, industry, buildings, and the total amount, as I said, would reach 66%. So this is not just about power, this is all about renewable energy in all the sectors, all the end use sectors. Uh, it's important to acknowledge the role of electrification. So electrification with renewables has a very important role in this increasing renewable energy penetration. As you can see here, again, the historical process progress is around 23 to 26% share in the global energy matrix. If you look at the current plans, we may reach 55, 38 by 2030. 
and the, the 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 amount that we would like to that's needed indeed to deliver the decarbonization that's required for the well below two degree is around as you can see 86 percent that's the renewable sharing in electricity generation in terms of electricity share we're talking about 50 percent by 2050 so this is the level of effort that is needed some examples or applications in terms of end use sectors in physical numbers. So the electric cars that will be uh, needed, it's around 1 billion by 2050, as well heat pumps uh, delivering electricity, uh, uh, heat from electricity. So that's a, a very important aspect to consider. And as much as we go into the electric electrification with renewables, there is the aspect of flexibility. As you can see here, variable renewable energy will increase up to 60% in our grids. Uh, as you can see, we're talking about a lot of wind and solar, and there is a role of batteries and all the sector coupling solutions. Uh, perhaps uh, one example is this electrification of the, I mean, the EVs, the electrification of transport, and all the batteries that we would be able to count on to uh, deliver flexibility. But at the end of the day, we're talking about uh, a, a, an integrated uh, uh, system flexibility approach. Uh, hydropower and bioenergy, they are crucial to this transition. Hydropower has an important role to play in terms of delivering flexibility as well renewable. And of course, bioenergy has a role to play not just in transport, we will see uh, later on as well, uh, there is an important role to play in terms of biomass, heat, etc. Hydrogen. We have been, uh, we have a lot of hydrogen in the previous discussions, and hydrogen indeed, uh, it's becoming more and more important. As you can see here, uh, hydrogen can play a role in the hard to decarbonize sectors as well. Uh, if you look at the sector coupling solutions, hydro hydrogen is very important. But indeed, we need to look at the competitiveness of this solution. Uh, in terms of the power mix, as you can see here, 86% uh, by 2050 will be from renewables. This is the normative approach. That's 8,000 gigawatts of solar PV, 6,000 gigawatts plus of wind. So it's a huge effort in terms of uh, accelerating the transformation in the power sector as well. It, however, uh, this graph shows that by 2050, we may not reach the complete decarbonization of all the sectors. So these remaining emissions, uh, as you can see in the 2050, uh, it's around 10 gigatons. Uh, so that's not related to the 1.5 and towards 1.5 that's been discussed on the Paris Agreement. So how to go deeper in terms of this decarbonization? As we can see, the remaining emissions are related to industry and transport. So the heavy industry, basically steel, iron, chemicals, petrochemicals, cement, aluminium, etc. And of course, aviation and shipping. We have heard the panel before discussing very interesting discussion. So this deep decarbonization perspective would, would be needed by, by 2050. And we have several alternatives here to go to zero. Uh, and they are related to uh, behavior change. They are related to technologies, including ECS and also, of course, energy efficiency and, forward and, and, and further renewable energy penetration in all the sectors. So not just power, but also in all end users. So, of course, that will imply investment. As you can see in this graph, uh, in the plan and energy scenario, so the current policies, we will need 95 trillions. In the transforming energy scenario, we'll reach 110 trillions and the deep GDP decarbonization, 10, 20 trillions more. So this is possible. There is a lot of opportunities here. As you can see, the shares, I'm not going to the details, but basically electrification with renewables and energy efficiency is key. The benefits are there. So the energy transition will bring, uh, of course, a lot of investments, but of course, the benefits, not just in terms of returns, uh, economic returns, but also the externalities that are related are very welcome. Uh, it's a system-wide transformation. It's not just about energy. We're talking about impact in all, all kinds of sectors. As you can see here, there are a lot of indicators that we're trying to map. Uh, have a, 
look on, I'm not going to the details, but basically there is an impact, of course, in the oil and coal sector or the fossil fuel related. There is a, a, an important aspect that here we need to, to raise attention, that's the, the, the policy action. Indeed, there is in all sectors important actions to be taken. As I would just uh, like to highlight the importance of this di distributed energy source deployment in the power sector. And of course, the change that's needed in the transport sector, including all related to freight, aviation, and shipping. Uh, so having said that, Thank you very much and welcome and welcome to the questions and answers. Thank you. Back to you, Professor. Thank you very much indeed, Ricardo. What I'd like to do is uh, for you to think about your questions and we should move on to our next speaker, Ulrich uh, Lahmans. Yes, good afternoon, everybody, and greetings from the conference center in Kifisia. My presentation, I'm going to talk about the experiences of uh, with the energy transition in Germany. Let me just open this. Okay, if I may. So my name is Ulrich Lomans. I'm working for GZ, which is um, a German public benefit company active in the field of international cooperation for sustainable development. So my presentation is about the experiences with the energy transition in Germany. Let's take a look at the historical background. The first reference to the term Energiewende, which is German for energy transition, was in 1980 in a study of the German Oco Institute and the conference Energy Transition, Nuclear Phase Out and Climate Protection. From its beginning, this term was associated with the environmental and anti-nuclear movement, which became part of mainstream energy policy in Germany after the year 2000, and in particular also in relation to the election of the German Green Party to the national government. Since 2010, the term Energiewende has become a standard reference in official government communication on energy. And it's understood to mean the transition towards a secure, clean and affordable energy supply, the so-called energy policy triangle. Here are some major milestones in the international and German en energy transition. Uh, I think you're familiar with the international ones. So in Germany, 30 years ago, the so-called Electricity Feed and Act was adopted, which for the first time introduced um, dedicated feed and tariffs for the injection of electricity from renewable energy sources. In 1997, Germany adopted a minus 21% reduction greenhouse gas emission reduction target under the Kyoto Protocol. And in the year 2000, the so-called Renewable Energy Sources Act, the EEG, has been adopted. This was followed in 2002 by the Energy Saving Ordinance and the Nuclear Energy Act, which decided to phase out of nuclear energy in Germany. In 2007, the Integrated Energy and Climate Protection Program was adopted followed in 2010 by the so-called energy concept, which provided a roadmap for the energy sector until 2050. In the year 2011, also in relation to the Fukushima nuclear accident, there was a decision to accelerate the phase out of nuclear energy in Germany until 2022. In 2014, the Renewable Energy Act was amended, and again in 2016, together with some other legislation on the electricity market and the digitization of the energy transition. The governance of the energy transition in Germany is a multi-layered system, starting with the federal and state coordination at the top level, so this includes a coordination between all the involved uh, ministries at the federal level, as well as the different federal states, 
which also pursue to some extent their own energy policies. The Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy is in charge of the coordination of the energy transition and their regular stakeholder dialogues, for example, on the electricity grid, on electricity market design and so on, which are being organized at the national level. There is also very strong engagement of the society and the private sector in the promotion and the implementation of the energy transition. And all this is supported by a dedicated monitoring system consisting of annual monitoring reports, which have been published since 2012, on the progress of the energy transition based on key indicators and supported by an independent commission of experts. There is also broad public support for the energy transition in Germany, about 90% um, yeah, generally support uh, the targets and objectives of the ener energy transition. And there are also a large uh, number of German households which um, are participating through the purchase and installation of clean energy technologies, such as, for example, solar thermal, solar PV and heat pumps. Here are some key energy and climate targets in Germany. For greenhouse gas emissions in 2019, we had already achieved a reduction of 35.7% compared to 1990. This, however, was lower than the target of 40% for 2020. But due to the impact of the coronavirus pandem pandemic, this target for 2020 is likely to be achieved. Until 2030, greenhouse gas emissions are supposed to be reduced by 55%. And until 2050, Germany aspires to become completely carbon neutral. For renewable energy, we had in 2019 a share of 42%. This is already significantly more than the target of 35% that has been set for um, 2020. So this target is also achieved. And in terms of gross final energy consumption, we had a share of 17% in 2019 compared to a target of 18% in 2020. So this target is also going to be achieved. Concerning the medium and long-term targets um, in Germany for renewables, these are yeah, to some extent outdated and they are subject um, to future revisions which are foreseen to be implemented. For energy efficiency, we had uh, in 2019 a reduction of primary energy consumption of 11% compared to the levels of 2008. This, however, is much lower than the official target of minus 20% for 2020. So there is uh, still a big challenge to achieve, let's say, further energy reductions in order to um, fulfill the medium target of minus 30% and the long-term target of minus 50% until 2050. There are also some additional targets for energy efficiency, which you also find on this slide. In terms of greenhouse gas emission reductions, we can see from this diagram that basically in all sectors, greenhouse gas emissions have been reduced, but in particular in the energy industry, of course, due to the increasing shares of renewable energies in the electricity sector. This is something that you can see on this slide. The installed renewable energy capacities in Germany have increased from just 4 gigawatt in 1990, which was mainly hydropower, to a total of 118 gigawatt in 2018 mainly wind, onshore wind, also during the last years, an increasing, increasing share of offshore wind and uh, photovoltaic energy with uh, biomass and hydropower also contributing some smaller shares. Electricity generation in Germany in 2019 was already almost 50% uh, produced from renewable energy sources. But you can also see that we still have significant shares of coal, around 30%, nuclear energy, around 14%, and also gas with 10%. 
for nuclear energy, as it was mentioned before, there is a target to completely phase out this technology from the German electricity system until 2022. So the 21 gigawatt of nuclear power plants that we had in the year 2000 have already been reduced to below 10 gigawatts. And the last six nuclear power stations are going to be decommissioned in 2021 and 2022. For coal, there are also some phasing out targets that have recently been adopted um, by the German government. So here there's a target at the latest until 2038 to phase out uh, the use of coal, both hard coal and lignite in the German electricity system. This means that from the 50 gigawatt of coal that we had in 2015, these are supposed to be reduced to 30 gigawatt in 2022, 17 gigawatt in 2030, and uh, a complete phase out until 2038, which might be brought forward to 2035. In order to achieve all these targets, um, there are several policies and measures that have been adopted um, and in the context of the so-called Climate Action Program 2030 of last year. These include, for example, investments in energy efficiency in the industry, the expansion of renewables and uh, CHP, tax breaks for energetic refurbishment, the promotion of um, electromobility and investments in public transport. From next year, there is also going to be a national carbon pricing system, which is supposed to be introduced for the non-ETS sectors. So for the fossil fuels that are sold, for example, for heating or for the transport sector, um, increasing carbon prices are going to be introduced. In addition, in the context of the economic stimulus package of June 2020, there have been some additional measures for uh, the support of the energy transition which have been adopted. This includes uh, the allocation of 9 billion euros for the implementation of the new national hydrogen strategy for Germany. Uh, as well as additional subsidies that are supposed to be provided to municipalities for public transport, to consumers for the purchase of electric vehicles and for the installation of charging infrastructure, as well as for the building renovation program um, that exists already since some time in Germany. So this is a brief summary of main developments, recent developments in Germany in the field of energy transition. Thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much indeed, Ulrich. Could we then um, move on to uh, hear Marina uh, um, Ekonomidou uh, for her presentation. You're mute at the moment. Marina, you are mute at the moment, as far as I can hear. You're not coming across by sound. Hello, can you hear me now? You can now, yes, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so I'll start again. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, my name is Marina Economidu. I work for the Joint Research Center of the European Commission, and I'm honored and privileged to be part of this session today, hosted by the Hellenic Association for Energy Economics, as I truly believe that the green energy transition will shape our world of tomorrow. And it is for this reason that the current commission has put so much emphasis on this area. So before I start, I would like to say a couple of words about the Joint Research Center, GRC. The GRC is the Science and Knowledge Service of the Commission. Uh, we're in the fortunate position of being a research institute inside the executive arm of the EU. 
And as a strategic partner, we're able to participate in policymaking discussions. So this gives us the unique opportunity of being at the interface between science and policy. And today, more than ever, we need sound evidence to support policy, so we take our role very seriously. And our mission is to really support EU policies with independent evidence throughout the whole policy cycle, from design to evaluation. To do so, we have over 2,000 scientists working on the sides of the GRC on a wide range of scientific disciplines. And we do this work of connecting disciplines and policies, and at the same time, talk, uh, talking directly to policymakers. Our headquarters are located in Brussels, and we have research facilities in five member states. We host laboratories and uh, unique uh, research um, uh, facilities, uh, drawing on over 60 years of scientific uh, expertise. And we strive to continually build on this um, experience and really serve at the heart of the interest of EU citizens. So I mentioned in the beginning that the energy transition is a political priority for the current Commission. And it is in this context that the European Commission has set out the target to achieve a climate neutral economy by 2050. The European Green Deal is uh, mainly uh, the main uh, policy vehicle set to make this a reality. And in particular, it provides an overarching action plan to boost the efficient use of resources including energy, and to move to a clean circular economy, and at the same time, restore biodiversity and cut pollutions, uh, pollution and emissions. So reaching this climate neutrality target will require action by all sectors and by all stakeholders in our economy, including investments in environmentally friendly technologies, um, supporting industry to innovate, rolling out clean, cheap, and healthy forms of private and public transport, decarbonizing the energy sector, ensuring buildings are more energy efficient, and working with international partners to improve uh, global European, uh, global environmental standards. Now, buildings present a great um, challenge, but yet a great opportunity. At the EU level, 40% of the energy we use is consumed by buildings, and buildings are responsible for at least a third of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And we know from studies that um, at least 75% of the existing buildings are, are largely energy inefficient. Uh, so with current renovation rates of around 1%, the road to decarbonize, decarbonize buildings is long and complex. And this is why we need to uh, focus on, on this sector and accelerate efforts um, in order to and uh, ensure that buildings of the future will be um, carbon neutral. Now, the good news is that renovation is a major opportunity for economic growth. It provides jobs and boosts the construction sector, which is largely dominated by local businesses. And at the same time, it strengthens uh, Europe's industrial competitiveness. Building renovation is therefore central also to the post-COVID-19 economic recovery and was uh, specifically referred to in the recovery plan, plan uh, published by the European Commission this May. So the European Commission has set this renovation wave, which is the flagship initiative of uh, both the European Green Deal and the recovery plan for Europe. And the aim of this initiative is to at least double the annual renovation rates of existing buildings across Europe. Um, through this plan, it's expected to provide a major boost to jobs and to provide many uh, upskilling and reskilling workforce opportunities. And it's also designed to tackle the worst performing building first and to um, showcase um, the example of public, the public sector and public buildings like uh, educational buildings, uh, hospitals, etc., in order to lead the way. I should also stress that actions in the building sector are not new. The EU has been uh, a leader in this area over many decades now. Uh, and with the first initial policy efforts um, dating back to the 1970s in response to the oil crisis. This year, we actually published a paper reviewing the entire 
policy framework in the building sector over the last 50 years, discussing the main uh, evolutions and key trends over these periods. And we know that policies at the EU level um, are a um, wide range and include national building codes, um, uh, regulations for efficiency requirements for energy using equipment and uh, financial uh, support to stimulate further energy efficiency investments. And uh, despite the earliest efforts, the major steps in boosting energy efficiency at the EU level stemmed from the main directives of 2002 of the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive, the Eco Design uh, Directive of 2005, uh, and the Energy Services direct uh, Directive of 2006. But this has also um, been uh, reinforced by more recent uh, policy actions, including the EPPD Recast, uh, the Energy Efficiency Directive of 2012, and now the very new uh, amendments of uh, the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive and the Energy Efficiency Directive. Um, what is also important to note is um, what the key um, uh, focus of the European Commission currently is in terms of buildings as we move forward. Uh, we know that the Renovation Wave Initiative uh, will be built on uh, several of the measures that I have mentioned before, um, but it will also be um, uh, built on um, um, measures stipulated in the Clean Energy for Europeans package, including the requirement for uh, EU countries to develop a long-term building renovation strategy. Um, this strategy is first submitted in 2014 under the Energy Efficiency Directive, um, provide uh, an overall framework to enable member states to put in place policies and measures in order to decarbonize the entire building stock by 2050. And in the latest versions of these um, of these strategies in 2020, which were submitted in March actually this year, there has been more effort being put on some key areas such as uh, ways to tackle energy poverty, to tackle market failures and barriers within the sector and to address uh, not only energy efficiency issues but also health and safety issues and um, to also take into account wider benefits of energy efficiency improvements in the building sector. Um, the latest uh, renovation strategies submitted by member states also require um, countries to set up measurable progress indicators and indicative milestones for 2030, 2014, 2050. And we're currently in the process of analyzing uh, these plans and these strategies uh, sent by member states um, in order to understand whether there is any gap remaining and, and whether um, member states are ambitious enough in order to tackle these this challenge. I should also mention that um, many building related aspects nowadays stem from the national energy and climate plans. Uh, these plans uh, are set in the context of the Energy Union Governance Regulation of 2018 and uh, the plans themselves um, include five dimensions, uh, cover not only energy efficiency but also renewable energy, um, uh, the integrated uh, electricity market, research and innovation, etc. And as part of these plans, member states have also need to uh, communicate to the Commission um, on the targets uh, that they have in terms of energy efficiency, renewable energy and greenhouse gas emissions. And as you know, um, uh, recently the Commission has raised the ambition um, of, of its climate targets, and now it proposes uh, at least 55% cut in emissions by 2030. So this is yet another push to um, make more efforts in this area. Lastly, I would like to um, also emphasize something on financing. This is a critical part um, of the whole uh, policy picture. Um, the Smart Finance for Smart Buildings initiative um, is a main initiative uh, launched uh, in 2016 um, as part of the Clean Energy for All Europeans package by the European Commission. And it aims to unlock investments and private financing 
through several um, actions, including technical assistance and, and aggregation opportunities of projects within the sector, um, de-risking facilities, and effective, a more effective use of um, public um, uh, funding. So this initiative has already stimulated financing for building uh, renovation and uh, promotes the combination of a guarantee facility with grants and technical assistance. Uh, and uh, there are several initiatives um, uh, by the Commission, uh, ongoing in initiatives in this area, including the European Local Energy Assistant ELENA um, uh, program, and the DEEP platform, uh, which is a database um, gather information about projects uh, aimed at de-risking energy efficiency investments and other, uh, and other tools. So with this, I would like to conclude my presentation and thank you very much for your attention and your patience. And I would like also to ask you to keep in touch by connecting with one of our social media channels. And should you have any questions, please um, uh, let me know. And I would also um, invite you to Contact me if you'd like to have more resources in this area. Thank, Thank you very you much. much indeed, Marina. Um, we move swiftly on to our fourth and last speaker, but please keep your questions uh, ready for our final uh, discussion period. So our final speaker is Mel Idreos, who will remind us that uh, natural gas uh, has a very important part still to play. And he may also have some comments on whether hydrogen is going to make a comeback successfully, or it will be uh, the third time uh, over the last uh, uh, 40 or 50 years that it has come and then disappeared almost without trace. So over to you, Mel. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Jefferson. Um, great to be with you. And if I may, Herete uh, Kigalispera Boto Torondo. Uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to speak at this important event, even unfortunately, virtually. Congratulations for putting together a very relevant and important set of panels to speak to the issues in front of us at a time of great unprecedented challenge. Until recently, I held the position of Executive Public Affairs Director at the International Gas Union, and my remarks today will relate to a recent report that the IGU and the Boston Consulting Group released on the role of gas technology and innovation for a sustainable energy future. I want to start off by providing a bit of information about what is contained in the report and what is in the new analysis that was undertaken. The scope was to look at 12 key technologies that we felt have real potential to change the dynamic of how gas is delivered and consumed. Broadly speaking, we looked at these 12 categories of technologies across three dimensions. First, their potential to enable climate action and sustainable cities. The second, through low carbon gas technologies. And third, through technologies that are able to unlock greater access to energy. It goes without saying that these are three areas that are aligned with the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and secondly, demonstrate the importance of gas and its contribution to their achievement. That is the major theme throughout the report. With those 12 technologies in mind, we undertook a real comprehensive bottom-up assessment of individual developments from a technology perspective and how they are unlocking greater efficiency improvements, improvement uh, reduction in costs on CapEx, in particular for access to gas, and how these technologies are changing the flexibility of how gas is consumed, where, and when. The third step throughout all of this was to take a long range view of the potential economic role of these different technologies. And the major emphasis of the report is around the economic potential of gas. Rather than create another forecast, 
which we have all seen forecasts like the many IEA ones, where various modeling that is done on energy systems results in fundamentally providing a forecast of a specific set of outcomes, we took a much broader view of economic potential of gas, considering where and when gas is and could be competitive in the next few decades against other energy sources. This based all on the improvements that we are identifying and we are seeing both occurring and emerging in cost efficiency improvements in gas technologies, as well as applying the lens of increasing climate action and sustainability. So critically for this, we looked at the economic competitiveness and the economic potential of gas relative to other energy sources with the climate action and sustainability goal in mind. The key findings that came out of the analysis is that we do see a tremendous potential for gas technologies to address climate change and enable climate action significantly across all of these technologies up to 30 percent of the current global ghg emissions could be abated by the economic potential of these technologies what we found was that across all these categories was that most gains can actually happen in the near term, particularly around the technologies that are enabling fuel switching in the power and industrial sectors and where gas is used in transport, while along with using gas to manage intermittency and seasonality. These accounted for almost six, six gigatons of potential emission reductions if they would be adopted for their maximum potential. This is a major improvement and additional reduction to the base case identified, which was the IA's sustainable energy scenario, as opposed to the stated policy scenario. It is clear, striking number of, uh, of uh, speaks to the potential out there uh, to the very near term opportunities. It really does. The second major finding was that the economic potential for low carbon gas uh, is also very significant in the next 20 years. Technologies like renewable gas, hydrogen, and CCUS are often thought of as technologies playing a very long term role, but already in the 20 year horizon, in the modeling, we see significant potential. And finally, technologies that are enabling greater adoption of gas in buildings, distributor generation, as well as small scale LNG for distribution of gas in smaller and particularly remote areas play another role that is very important. The second lens that we looked at consistent with the sustainable development goals was the potential for gas to reduce air pollution. Something certainly that has a very much raised profile through the current pandemic, particularly in the mega cities around the world. When you apply the assumptions around the maximum economic potential of these technologies, we see a very material contribution to the reduction of key global air quality pollutants and fast. Third is the area of providing energy access. One of our really telling insights coming from our bottom-up technology assessment report was the emerging technologies that are enabling access to gas as low cost and ultimately in easier form that reduces infrastructure and upfront cost investments that are required to access gas around the world. This plays a key role in developing and underserviced countries in Asia and Africa, where the greatest population remains without access to clean cooking fuel in particular. The modeling indicates that at the maximum economic potential of gas, that it can result in providing access to gas to over 1 billion people by 2040 in an area where we all know 
remains on one of the most challenging aspects of the sustainable development goals to ensure that everyone has access to energy and clean cooking fuels. Finally, the key question is what will it take to achieve this economic potential and to continue to promote gas technologies to unlock this potential? And for that, there is a chapter in the report that is an action plan where we look at three fundamental drivers that are going to be critical to enable the adoption of these technologies. What is laid out in the report is a broad range and menu of policy options that are available. But the telling story and insight to this is that there is no one silver bullet. Even within one given technology area, different countries, different geographies can adopt policies that are more applicable to their circumstances available to unlocked R&D and innovation. Now, I realize I've covered a lot of ground in a short time and would encourage you to uh, dig into the report. Uh, the report can be downloaded from the IGU website, www.igu.org. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity and back to you, Professor. Thank you much indeed, Mel. So we're now going to open uh, for discussion. And what I'd like to do is to start with any questions that uh, anybody has uh, for Ricardo. So anybody who's got any questions, would they please uh, either virtually or directly uh, give them to Ricardo? Do we have a system for this? If we don't, uh, I would like to put one question to Ricardo. Irena uh, has uh, recently come up uh, with a paper on scenarios where the emphasis appears to be on the need for modeling as a sort of central goal or means of uh, developing scenarios. Um, I've had some uh, 50 years of experience in this field. Um, and uh, in particularly with shell scenarios, the practice has been to keep modeling after some rather poor global modeling experiences uh, to looking and testing out specific aspects of scenarios. What do you feel about that? Where would your emphasis be on the modeling or on a closer examination of individual aspects and particularly getting to the bottom of what is really going on about uh, energy supply and energy use, its actual efficiency and the efficacy of, for instance, wind and solar systems. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, that's a very good uh, topic to discuss. Uh, and I think that's, that's under what we call the energy planning discussions, long-term energy planning, if you if you prefer. And uh, indeed, if we're looking up at the energy transformation, as I explained, there are massive and important changes that are needed. That cannot really happen without planning, without a proper planning. So in this context, indeed, modeling is, is an important part of the equation. Uh, but of course, we, we should not leave just under the modeling discussions. So it's very important to understand what the models are really uh, telling us. And of course, the implementation of those results, of those interpretations are key. Of course, uh, each country, each region has its own context in terms of characteristics and situations. So we need to, of course, adjust accordingly. But at the end, uh, the long-term planning and the planning should be in the agenda. Specifically, in terms of modeling, uh, I, I think uh, it's important to, to consider both because, of course, parameters are key in this modeling discussion. So we need to be able, at the same time, to have the overview of the trends 
And at the same time, we need to be consistent in how the parameters and how the operation of the system will work. So I would, uh, I would consider a, a combination of, of models, a chain of models in order to make uh, this consistency approach uh, and of course to uh, be able to deliver the, the, the proper uh, recommendations and the proper interpretation for models. So I think... Th thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Ricardo. Do any of our other speakers this afternoon have any questions that they would like to direct to Ricardo? No? Okay, well, let's just move on to um, Ulrich, but uh, before we do so, let me remind you of what the last IPCC Working Group 1 report uh, stated, that 111 out of 114 of their uh, sophisticated uh, climatic models uh, were overstating the uh, warming between 1998 and 2012. So you could say, well, that's pretty dismissive. Let's ignore the models. However, of course, they also pointed out that between 1950 and 2012, the modeling had been doing rather better. So we're going to have to keep a little bit of an open mind, I think, on these questions. So any, any questions uh, for, for uh, Ulrich on particularly the situation and prospects for Germany? And if any other of our other speakers uh, have any questions for Ulrich, please let them know. No? Well, Ulrich, all I can say is, of course, I'm surprised that uh, uh, Germany was so keen to get out of nuclear, uh, but nevertheless uh, still keen on um, uh, d digging in for more brown coal. Uh, but uh, let us move on from that to what is going to really... Uh, increase the average capacity factors achieved by Germany when you're continuing to have pressure to have onshore uh, wind energy developments in areas of relatively low mean wind speed and at the same time pressure to have uh, ground-based solar PV systems in areas north of uh, Bavaria where the sol solar insulation levels are not terribly high. There's a couple of serious constraints there, I think. Yes, thanks, Michael, for this uh, interesting question. Um, yes, I agree with you that capacity factors in Germany for several renewable energy technologies are not uh, so high as in other regions around the world. For example, if you look at the case of Greece, we have capacity factors of uh, photovoltaics which are much higher than what we have in Germany. So you might wonder what is the point of using these uh, technology, technologies in Germany. I think even for wind energy, the average capacity factor here in Greece is higher than in Germany. Now, the thing is that um, there are, of course, different um, advantages and uh, comparative advantages of uh, different countries when it comes to using specific renewable energy sources. In the end, however, I think we need um, all technologies that uh, should contribute to a mixed um, energy system. Uh, in Germany, for example, we have uh, a lot of onshore wind projects that have been um, realized in, at low wind uh, sites. So this means sites not next to the North Sea, but uh, let's say in inland Germany, uh, wind speeds are significant, significantly lower. So these um, uh, wind plants actually have lower capacity factors, but they have uh, the advantage that they can produce or they are producing electricity during times when the wind parks in the north uh, might not be producing. So actually this regional distribution also contributes um, to stabilizing electricity production and to decrease this uh, variability of electricity um, generation, as Ricardo mentioned. The same for photovoltaic uh, systems. Uh, you 
will have also, you will need a regional distribution of uh, these systems also at the European level in order to avoid uh, situations where you have uh, no generation from renewables and you have to activate, for example, backup uh, fossil power plants. So I think I'm not uh, so concerned about the capacity factors. Uh, by the way, Germany is also putting now a lot of emphasis in the development of offshore wind, which of course has very high capacity factors uh, in the range of 40% and, uh, and above. So I think with this uh, mix of different technologies at different sites, I think we can make uh, the energy transition a success. Of course, um, with time, things are also going to become more difficult because the best sites probably are going to be the first that are going to be exploited. So you would also need to expect uh, some decrease of capacity factors due to this effect. On the other side, you also have uh, technological pro progress that you have to take into consideration. The technologies are getting more efficient and are producing more electricity than they have been in the past, for example, with wind turbines um, shifting to larger rotor sizes. So these are all different components that you have to take into consideration. Um, and I think, uh, of course, energy models should be based on realistic assumptions with regards also to future capacity factors. Thank you very much, Ulrich. Yes, it's much is going to depend upon how long those offshore uh, um, wind turbines uh, manage to keep, keep on going. Um, uh, clearly, there's a, a, a risk of a fairly uh, rapid start of, of deterioration uh, and perhaps uh, early need for replacement. Now, Marina, you got me totally uh, pessimistic about uh, the building sector. Um, I'm li I, and I'm speaking, by the way, as uh, somebody who lives in an area where we don't even have natural gas. Uh, I mean, I... I do, I do buy a, a can of gas uh, a containers uh, for uh, one of our fires, but that's the nearest that uh, anybody in our village can, can get to, to gas. So uh, I'm going to be interested to hear what Mel has to say on that point later. But on, on buildings, um, this is really a major problem, isn't it? I mean, your, your, your roadmaps, 2030, 2040, do you think this is really realistic? 80% ancient buildings? Um, I have to say that we have done um, a great progress, despite the picture not looking very um, optimistic, let's say. If we look at the data and if we look at, for instance, the residential sector um, over the last few decades, um, the normalized consumption by climate, um, building size, um, uh, wealth, uh, other factors, we do see a declining trend in the consumption um, of residential buildings. So we do see that there is an impact, uh, possibly policies do have impact on energy consumption. And uh, the EU, uh, I would say, is one of the leaders in this area. We have strict building regulations nowadays, uh, not only for new buildings, uh, which are required as of end of this year in Europe to be of nearly zero energy levels, uh, but also now there is more and more actions for um, the renovation of existing buildings. And that is really the great challenge we have ahead. Um, the vast majority of our existing buildings will be in place, will be standing by 2050. So we need to get them ready um, uh, to be climate neutral uh, by the time. So it is a great challenge. And there are several policies in place um, to help achieve that. And the Commission is very keen on uh, boosting uh, and um, increasing the ambition in this area for the building sector. Um, 
Mm. And, and despite the efforts on the regulatory um, front, the Commission is also recognizing the need that we need to have more mobilization of financial actors in this area. Um, so there is more and more um, emphasis on the need of financing and also on the need of um, helping all the households in, 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 we talk about the residential sector to, to become more efficient. So um, there is the issue of energy poverty in lots of European countries, uh, households that are not able at the moment to uh, heat up to the um, comfort levels that, um, let's say, richer households have the luxury of doing so. So yeah, there is the other social aspect of what we're doing, which is to, to help uh, everyone, so to also support um, uh, low-income households in this transition to be part of it and to um, uh, take actions to improve efficiency in, in the sector. Yeah, thank, but I, you. The thank you very much, Marina. And indeed, energy poverty, particularly in the more uh, hilly areas of Greece, is, remains a very serious problem. Well, finally, to Mel, um, you've mentioned hydrogen. Um, do you really think that it's going to take off now, or are we going to have another little uh, uh, months, a few months of excitement, and then we'll be going the way of uh, the Dutch with their hydrogen tanks on their car roofs and Ballard uh, being in, in, the, in the media we, at weekly stages 20 years ago and then disappearing from the scene almost. Well, I think, uh, I, I think uh, we're into, as you said, sort of the third cycle uh, with respect to hydrogen. Um, I do also uh, feel that there, well, hydrogen has become in the last six months the silver bullet. It, it seems that way. Um, and of course, there's a lot of very significant challenges that still need to be overcome uh, to make hydrogen a very viable uh, uh, contributor uh, to the energy systems. However, we, I can say we have the same issue with electric vehicles. Uh, you know, go back to who, who killed the electric vehicle um, when there was some momentum around electric vehicles. But what I see now is a very much renewed and focused approach towards uh, electric vehicles, which I think are here to stay uh, and, and we'll see growth in that. And I think in the same way, I see a lot of governments putting an awful lot of more uh, attention towards hydrogen than ever before. And as long as we can overcome those fairly significant challenges, uh, I mean, the, the cost of electrolyzers has to come down significantly in order to make hydrogen competitive. We have the, the other issue of infrastructure, and I speak from the gas industry, which, of course, our, in, our infrastructure will be key to moving hydrogen around. Um, can you know what quantities can we move safely? What improvements to the infrastructure need to be made? How do we store hydrogen? So some very very big challenges. But I think overall, I think if there was a time where we have a chance of making hydrogen real, I think this is the time. Well, thank you very much, Mel. Thank you everybody for uh, your contributions and all of you who've been listening uh, for being so patient with us all. Um, I would just finally say that, of course, as far as uh, Mel's contribution is concerned, uh, BP and Shell have been here before on hydrogen, disappeared, and of course come back very enthusiastically. So it all depends upon who you believe and for how long. And on that happy note, uh, and wishing you all free of COVID-19, I could go into that subject for a couple of hours, but I think... You've had a very long day. Thank you very much indeed for your contributions. Thank you. Thank you, Michael.